Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. This week's episode is brought to you by Wondrium, Wondrium Wondrium.com, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com, the former teaching company, The Great Courses. And with the new subscription service they set up here through uh, their rebranding as Wondrium, you get access to all those great uh, courses through the teaching company, plus lots of documentary series, films, learning units, and and, and various other um, content that they've produced through uh, adjacent companies. And now it's just endless content that you can listen to while you're driving, cycling, hiking, walking, doing chores, doing the dishes. I I just listen to these things all the time. So the offer today is that if you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, you get 22 free days of uh, content listening, after which you can subscribe or not, although I don't know why you wouldn't, because it's great. Like, for example, here's how to speak so that people want to listen. Well, no, there's an idea uh, I could probably uh, learn from. Uh, what else? Building love that lasts. Okay. I think I figured that one out, but you never know. I could probably learn something new there. England from the fall of Rome to the Norman conquest. That could be interesting. Ah, here we go. Understanding your inner genius. I don't think I have one, but, uh, maybe there's something in there that I could unleash. Uh, let's see what else they got here. They have, uh, 12 women who shaped America from 1619 to 1920. That's coming in uh, February. Oh, look at this one. Einstein's legacy, modern physics all around you. Okay, well, uh, that should be enough to keep me busy for a month, at least right there. So that's the deal. You subscribe through wondrium.com slash Shermer. You get 22 free days of listening. Bounce around from course to course, and lecture to lecture. If you don't like them, you can just stop and, and, and change course, literally. <laughs> so it's a great system. Please do support them uh, as that uh, supports the podcast as well. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy this next episode. My guest today is John Joe McFadden. His book is Life is Simple, How Occam's Razor Set Science Free and Shapes the Universe. John Joe McFadden is Professor of Molecular Genetics at the University of Surrey, where he studies the genetics of microbes that cause infectious diseases such as tuberculosis. He's the author of Quantum Evolution, and the co-author of Life on the Edge, and he lives in London with his wife and son. So we start the conversation talking about COVID, of course, because this is one of the things he does for a living, and uh, and discuss how we've been doing so far uh, in responding to the uh, the virus and and what he predicts for the future. Then we shift into discussing even actually the germ theory of disease as a form of simplicity in science to explain complex array of phenomenon which gets us into his book, Occam's Razor, and uh, the kind of shift from a theological medieval worldview to one in which science and religion are uh, separated, and and that continues to this day. So we go through the physical sciences, the biological sciences, the social sciences, the Enlightenment, all the way up into um, the modern world, Einstein, and all the way up to quantum physics. And then toward the end, I, I bring up some subjects like consciousness and free will, because he's written papers on these subjects, technical papers, in which he offers on this podcast nicely, I didn't even know this was going to come up, his theory of consciousness and why he thinks some of the other theories are wrong. Notably, I asked him about um, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff's theory of consciousness, and and he shows why that can't work at the quantum level. Uh, And instead, he introduces his field theory of consciousness. So, you can listen to that toward the end. We went almost two hours because there was so much interesting to discuss in the philosophy of science and how we determine causality, where are archetypal ideas, where do they exist, how can we know them, and so forth. Anyway, it was a really great conversation, ending on the problem of free will and determinism, of course, a perennial favorite here on this podcast. So if you appreciate the podcast, please go to skeptic.com slash donate and give us some support there. Your donations are tax deductible because it goes to the Skeptic Society. 501c3 nonprofit. And again, that's skeptic.com slash donate. This is Michael Shermer. Thanks for listening. Live, John Joe McFadden. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on and thanks for your wonderful new book, Life is Simple. Doesn't always seem that way these days, but uh, this is a history of science, how Occam's razor sets science free and shapes the universe. Now I have to, we're going to get into this and, uh, and, and go as long as we want because it's a great book. But since you are uh, a professor of molecular genetics at the University of Surrey, 
uh, and you study the genetics of microbes that cause infectious diseases. I can't uh, I can't let this go without asking you about COVID. Um, we're recording this. Let's see on January thirteenth, the day after your uh, the opposition party in your government calls for your uh, prime minister to resign because he called for a lockdown and then went out to dinner with no masks. And uh, the <laughs> same thing coffee. happened here. In, yes, in California, Governor uh, Gavin oh, really? Newsom. You know, I don't know a year and a half ago now or so. You know, locked locked everything down, closed restaurants, and then like the next day, he's at this super fancy French restaurant. You know, five hundred dollars a plate kind of dinner as a fundraiser. It, what are these people thinking? Yeah. Like they're not going to be noticed. <laughs> I think it's a, a kind of that uh, if they're making the rules, they kind of think that they're above them, beyond them, and um, and they don't really apply to them. The rules are for everyone else, but we're the rule makers. We don't have to apply. We don't have to comply with the uh, rules. It's the only thing I can think of, or sheer stupidity. <laughs> I don't suppose our yes. leaders we should uh, <laughs> yes. accuse of that. But uh, it, it seems astonishingly uh, um, odd thing to do, isn't it, when the whole country is in lockdown and um, and you decide to ho- hold a party. <laughs> this is exactly. When you've but made it's a the disease, rules. A contagious disease. Yeah. Uh, uh, expert, um, how do you think we've done so far? Um, I mean, it's all experimental. There's so much unknown. Uh, you know, people just don't know what quite know yeah. what to do, so they try different things. And how do you think we've done? And what do you think uh, is is, is going to happen this year? Well, to be honest, I'm astonished. To be honest, I'm astonished we've done so well. Um, we got the vaccine out, or, or the scientists and physicians and engineers, etc., got the vaccine out in a fantastically short time. And that has really saved the day. Otherwise, the world could be a much worse place today. And it still is a much worse place in many parts of the world where vaccine isn't really uh, uh, readily available. But uh, for us uh, fortunate people who live in the West, we have at least got the option of protecting ourselves pretty darn well with a very good vaccine. And that wasn't guaranteed. Um, I mean, look how long we've had HIV, for example. And no one's developed the vaccine for it, They've, despite billions of dollars of research money gone into the problem. Similarly for diseases like malaria, still no vaccine that, uh, that works. So it could have been as bad with COVID, but we were really lucky. There were approaches that they used and there were several different approaches. It all seemed to work. And that was a real stroke of luck that um, uh, was never never guaranteed. So I think we were... Well prepared in our preparedness to de- to develop a vaccine, that was good. Our diagnostic capacity, certainly in the UK, was not really up to the challenge for and didn't really catch up for about a year, really. And uh, in other respects, uh, antivirals were pretty poor with antivirals. We haven't really got many. I mean, look at the common cold or flu. Uh, they're not really well controlled with antivirals. So I think there's a lot more uh, need for research into that area. Um, and preparedness, you know, the worst uh, could yet to become, uh, yet to come. Uh, uh, we, we were, as I said, we were lucky. This virus, very, very infectious, uh, but susceptible to a vaccine strategy. The last big pandemic we had, uh, HIV, not very infectious, easily protected against, but no vaccine. I mean, there's nothing really stopping the infectious world out there developing a, a, another kind of virus which will be as infectious as COVID-19, as uh, SARS-CoV-2, and yet be a lot more difficult to develop a vaccine against and could, like HIV, hit the younger population. And then we've got a wholly different scenario. Yeah, it's good to recall that HIV, before there was a drug cocktail to treat it, uh, AIDS, that is, yep. was 100% was fatal. I mean, Hundred percent, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, into the nineties, mm, absolutely. Yeah, so here we're talking, mm. you know, a fraction of one percent, <clears throat> or one percent of one yeah. percent of death rate from Omicron or or whatever. It's pretty low. It could have been much worse. Mm. Maybe we dodged a bullet. And the, is there anything to the idea the age, that viruses natu- nat- naturally evolve toward being less fatal and, and less destructive in their effects, or do we? It's just a get tricky lucky? kind of thing. Um, it's, it seems to happen with at least some pathogens that they become less virulent because um, that isn't necessary for them. But actually for respiratory pathogens, it's 
it's really if anything the other way around usually because respiratory pathogens have to get around by making us cough and that's really what causes their disease excessive coughing uh, fluid being released in the respiratory system in the lungs causing pneumonia and that's really what gets most people in the end with respiratory disease and it's dependent on coughing for spreading so there'll always be a uh, a pressure, an evolutionary pressure on pathogens to make you cough and to transmit more readily. And that's coughing more. So it's it could be that we might be lucky now and again and a pathogen may become virulent. There's some evidence of that with Omicron. It seems to be a bit less virulent, but far more transmissible. So it kind of balances itself. It's less virulent, makes you cough less, but transmits more readily. So that probably balances the loss of transmissibility due to coughing some other way of getting around with Omicron but um, uh, it's nothing's guaranteed and we certainly can't rely on that um, and uh, you know but we, we must kind of remember that um, uh, well we won't remember but uh, if we read the history we know that you know half the world's population was wiped out by a pathogen um, in around about the 12th century and um, it wiped out most of them within the time it took us to develop a vaccine today. So, you know, there is potential for bigger disasters. Um, there's uh, all sorts of pathogens out there that are very deadly, unfortunately are reasonably well contained, like Ebola and pathogens like that. But it's not inconceivable that one of them could become more transmissible and really... Um, hit us uh, hard. So I think we have to we have to realize that actually pathogens kill more people than wars. And we really have to think about okay, what should we where should we putting our resources in uh, defending against wars which kill relatively small numbers of people in certainly for us in the west, very very small. Or do we put our put it in the um uh, in the hands of people who are going to uh, develop defenses against the agents that have killed more people in human history than anything else, pathogens, infectious microbes. They've killed more people than, far more people than wars or famine or anything else. And they're still out there. Yeah. John, Joe, let's just try moving your mic a little bit closer, if you can, uh, just to get a little more volume. Sure. Um, and, and while you're doing that, uh, okay. what I was thinking in, in my question was, if there's a purpose to evolution, um, it, it's to get your genes into the next generation through uh, vehicles like bodies. Um, so wouldn't it be uh, in the interests of viruses to be less deadly and more contagious? Uh, because if you're too deadly, like Ebola, then then it, the whole thing dies out before you can spread. The, the patients are dying before they can get out and go go out to uh, ball games and and interact with other people and cough on them or whatever. Um, is there anything to that that could, that that again we got lucky, yes, but maybe this particular kind of thing mm. is a generalization we can make. Well, there is some sense in it, and pathogens may may sometimes get to that point. But remember, pathogens don't have foresight, so they can't <laughs> think. Well, if I kill this next. Uh, my next victim, I'm not going to get to the victim after that. They don't think that. They don't think at all. Mm -hmm. So they just look. They just are evol evolved to, to, um, to be transmissible as as transmissible as possible. And if if that means, I mean, as as happens, we know it happens in populations. Sometimes a pathogen will make a population extinct because it wipes everything out, and that's bad for the pathogen. But the pathogen doesn't have the foresight to work that out and say, oh, I better slow down, I better pull back and uh, give my host a, a little more chance to recover. And that, they just carry on going. So it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's what's called, it's uh, the, what you're talking about of this finding a, a, a stable um, relationship between host and pathogen is very nice, but it's, it's, what's called, it's not what's called an evolutionary stable strategy. It's susceptible to cheating. So if we developed a nice, cozy relationship with our, our pathogen, say um, uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and some mutant appeared, that made you cough more and cause more illness, but it got transmissible, it would, it would uh, dominate. 
and um, and it wouldn't know that it may be doing a bad thing until the whole human uh, population has disappeared. Because as far as it's concerned, it's doing very well, getting from one organ, one host to another. So, because pathogens don't have foresight, they can be nastier than we would think would be necessary for their own benefit. Really, they ought to be more more restrained, but they don't know that. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yes. Well, all this is a perfect example of uh, of what your book is about, simplicity in science, that is trying to find theories to explain causal causality, what's going on in the world, and why does it happen, and by introducing fewer and fewer elements to explain it. Uh, and that's kind of what the germ theory of disease has done. So maybe we'll end up there at the end of the conversation. So let's just go back in time, you you know, to the early early modern period or even before that, to the medieval worldview, and think about uh, where you begin your book with William of Ockham. And here, let, let's just do this for fun. Let's let's think ourselves back into time. Like tonight here in Southern California, I'll go out and the moon's out. Jupiter, Saturn are out. I think Venus is up in the early morning. And when I look up, I I... I I know what I'm looking at. I mean, I know what, what a planet is. I learned this, you know, long ago. What would somebody say a thousand years ago or 600 years ago when they looked up and saw these planets? What were they thinking? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, it's very extraordinary for us to get back into that mindset because for the average medieval person, when they looked up at the night sky, they thought they were looking at the walls of heaven decorated with stars and planets. And behind that wall was God and the angels and saints. So they thought they were enclosed really in a theological cosmos in which the sky was the walls of heaven. It's called heaven for a reason. That's where they thought heaven was. God resided up up above the stars. And so did uh, the angels and the saints. And beneath them was hell. So... Although it's often thought that um, um, the medievals had a um, geocentric world, in fact, it was a Diablo-centric world because at the center of it all was hell. And their role in life was to make sure that when they died, they went up and not down. And everything in their, in their life was kind of, at least that was an omnipresent consideration. They had to get up there in the heavens, along with uh, the angels and saints, and not end up down below. And so they, they lived in a theological cosmos, very different from ours. We see stars that we know are these huge suns and planets and moons that we've, people have visited. All of that was decoration, God's decoration, decorating his walls, basically. That was what the medieval people thought, and this is where science really kicked off making the heavenizing the heavens if you like making the heavens into a place and william of Ockham actually very early on said i can't remember the exact word, words but it was something like i see no reason to believe that uh, what's above us is any different from what's below us so he was one of the first people to say no nah, it's probably not anything to do with angels and stuff like that the stuff above on the, mo- on the moon and the stars, same material that's down below us, the rocks and the water and the stones, etc. So that was a world that they lived in. And not only was it um, uh, that were they surrounded by heaven below and uh, heaven above and hell below, but also everything in the world had some theological meaning. They had this notion which actually came from the ancient Greeks, Plato and Aristotle, that for every object, like I'm I'm actually looking at a tree, uh, sorry, at a a chair opposite me in the room, for every chair there was something called a universal of chair that made it a chair. Every lion had a universal of lionness that made it a lion. And that was very important because nobles had a universal of nobility. Kings had a universal of kingness, of royalty. Peasants and serfs had a universal of serfdom. And that's what they inherited. That's what their children inherited, this universal of serfdom. And the whole medieval structure of feudalism was kind of built on this idea that what you're born with is what your parents gave you. And if they were serfs, then you were a serf. 
And that could never be changed. And it was almost heretical for a serf to think he could, uh, he or she could escape from there where they were. And so there was that idea of, of the universals everywhere that underpinned the reality of every object. And then there was, uh, so that, and then there was the idea that everything had a cause. And a cause not only in the past where we would normally place a cause, like the cause of a fire might be someone lit it. The cause of a fire for the medievals was to warm people. So the cause is in the future. And this is what we call teleological causes. And um, that was also, all of those teleological causes eventually led to God. So um, where, uh, this was the same for universals, by the way. Universals, this reality of a chair being a chair because of a universal of a chair, that universal was held in God's mind. So if you're a scholar in the ancient world, you try to find out about these universals because then you could find what's in God's mind. You know, the worthy thing to do if you're a theologian. And then there was the theological causes, and all the causes led to God. So, for example, the cause of acorns was to feed pigs, the cause of pigs was to feed humans, the cause of humans was to worship God. So the whole world was saturated with theology. And this is, this is something totally different from our, our world today. Everything was theological, everything was spiritual. There was nothing, there was no kind of secularism at all. The world was saturated with theology. And this is where William of Ockham came in and said, no, it's not. Right, so your, your subtitle is How Ockham's Razor Set Science Free. Free from what? Well, at the time, um, what uh, free from a kind of strange uh, fusion of religion and science. Um, this was the mm. early medieval world, and the um, well, high medieval world, as it's sometimes called, uh, where people like Thomas Aquinas, a great theologian, a generation or so before Ockham, had uh, been hugely influenced by the rediscovery of ancient Greek texts, and particularly Aristotle. And Aristotle provided science in the medieval world. Um, Aristotle uh, wrote books of physics and books about animals and plants, and he was really a scientist at heart. So all of the medieval world's science was derived from Aristotle, pretty much. And Aquinas started on this project, really, of trying to fuse religion and science. So when William of Ockham went to Oxford to study theology. Theology at the time was called the Queen of Sciences. Just take a moment to think about that. Theology, the Queen of Sciences. And that was because Aquinas had managed to fuse science and religion, or so he thought, by, for example, uh, importing uh, Aristotle's reasoning to prove God in five different ways. So these were called the five ways of five roads to God. And he used arguments from Aristotle such as everything is moved is moved by something else. And um, so if you trace backwards all the movements, you come to a first mover who could only be God. Similarly, in that teleological cause um, that everything the, uh, has a, a cause in the future, what, what it's there for, well, there must be an ultimate final cause to everything could only be God. Similarly, Aquinas came up with these five proofs of God on these Aristotelian, mostly based on Aristotle. And then he claimed that theology was a science. So when, for example, William of Ockham came to Oxford to study theology, the kind of things he studied were these proofs of God, but also things like strange kind of questions which kind of fuse theology and science, like what are the gates of heaven made of? What is above the spheres? These were the, the heavens were spheres. Um, whether famously something like whether angels could dance on a pin and stuff like this. So they were really trying to, they, they didn't consider that science and theology were separate. They just were another way of finding out about God. So this is why science in the medieval world at the time was the queen of sciences. It was, whereas other kinds of sciences, like physics, might be about objects in the world, 
Theology was a science that ultimately gave you knowledge of God, or so they thought. And this is where William Vockham came in. He said, no, it doesn't. Um, he disproved all of Aquinas' five proofs of God. So he said they don't work because, for example, if you have uh, this argument that everything is moved, moved by another, and then you must come to a first mover, uh, it's not necessarily true because you could kind of have a cycle of moving things. That could be one way out of it. Or if you accept that there must be a first mover, it doesn't have to be God. It could be anything. It could be a donkey. It could be anything. Or if you accept that there is God that has the property of not requiring a, a mover before him, it's always him in the medieval world, and if the universe, is sorry, if God doesn't need a mover, then the universe might not need a mover. So he undermined all of these arguments for um, God, um, for proving God. Now he remained, this is, I think is really important, he remained, as far as we know, a devout Christian. He was a Franciscan friar. So as far as we know, for all his life, he believed in God and was devout. But he said that science and religion are separate and should not be mixed. So science is about reason, and religion is about faith. You can't prove God through reason, and you can't use faith to study the world. So William O'Rockham made this very clear distinction. There's science on one side, based on reason, it's the study of the world. And the world was freed also from these teleological causes. He said, no, there's none of those. And the universals, he said, no, there's none of those. You just have to study objects in the world, no invisible essences of a chair or a king or a noble or whatever. All of those don't exist, and there's no causes in the future. They don't exist either. So then science isn't after metaphysical entities of what's behind a chair or what's behind a donkey or whatever else, or what the cause of the donkey is. It's just about the objects themselves. And that's really science, secular science as we know it today. And he said that is so no very archetypes, different, completely just, different. And if totally you're going to study that particular no animal, archetypes. And no archetypes, although I guess maybe species is a kind of archetype, but, but it's very much grounded in a physical world. So, you know, we're used to thinking of uh, empiricism and reason. You know, when we think of science, we think of you know, reason, rationality, but also uh, looking out the window to see what's actually out there, to see if your your hypotheses are true. Yeah. Um, before Occam, people would not have thought of that, right? Of like, I wonder if this is actually the way it is. Yeah. Um, you know, let's go. Let, let's go yeah. build a telescope and look outside to see if there's actual crystal spheres out there. Mm. These were derived just through armchair philosophizing, right? You're just kind of thinking it through logically. Yeah. Yeah, famously, there was a line said about the medieval scholars that if there was an argument about how many teeth there are in, the, in a horse's head, they would consult Aristotle rather than looking at a horse. So that was <laughs> right. the way that they were. And what, what Occam said was, now you've got to study the object. And actually, uh, what a point I just want to emphasize is he, William of Occam, is, as far as I know, the first person in the history of the world to clearly separate science from religion. I don't know anyone earlier than William of Ockham. All of science follows from that. In fact, I would argue all of our secular world follows from that. That's really where we base our secular world on, that science and certainly, religion. Yeah, separate. certainly politically. I mean, to, we, we, separate, uh, we separate church yeah. and state. That's a, a derivative of that larger concept. Um, yeah, before we leave do the in medieval the US, world not view, in the UK, we do. Yeah, well, that's right. You still have uh, the, your head of okay, state okay. as the head of the church. Yeah, mm -hmm. No, not head of state, the, the head of the country, the queen. Uh, before we leave the medieval worldview, uh, at the, toward the end of the book, you address postmodernism, Wittgenstein, and, and these kind of ideas that the world we observe, we think we're observing, but really it's constrained by our language, which are you know just expressions of concepts or ideas that are in our skull. And, and and so we can't ever say we know for sure that we're right because you know things could change. So when we look back at the medievals, their worldview, their concepts grounded in language, the restrictions that Wittgenstein talks about, um, that's all true for them. I mean, can 
Yes, you and I will say, well, they were wrong about the planets. The, you know, the, they're not embedded in crystal spheres. Yeah, okay. But for them, it's a kind of truth, right? It's, it worked for them. It explained a lot of things. It provided comfort, I suppose, and structure for their world. And, and that's a kind of truth for them. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it did make, it made sense. These were not stupid people. They were very smart people who were doing this. But they had this approach of, when you couldn't explain something, invent something invisible to account for it. And this is the way that the world works, that science worked at the time. If you just, if you wondered what moved the moon, well, you said it's probably an angel. And that's how science worked. And then William Rockin came around and said, no, we've got to stop doing that. Use Occam's razor, the principle that you try to explain things with a minimum number of entities. But in, in, terms, of the, in terms of this argument about language, yes, I'm sympathetic to the view that we are stuck with language. And it does color our thinking. And that's why we use mathematics. Because mathematics doesn't really have a language. We can write mathematical equations that anyone in any culture can understand. And, um, and I think mathematics frees science from this problem. It is a problem. And we know that the words that we use uh, are loaded with meaning that isn't necessarily in the way that we use them, but other people may interpret them in a different way. And this was a postmodernist argument that because science is, uh, is written in language and it's discussed in language, it's a, prison, a prisoner of language. But just as, say, you know, our study of, uh, of um, art or, or or any other field is, is largely kind of described by language and science is the same. So it's, it's as, as subjective as, say, the study of art and whether um, Picasso is a greater artist than Renoir or, or someone like that. that. That's the kind of question which doesn't have an answer um, because of the nature of, of the unknowability of these, uh, of these things. It's all subjective, but it isn't in science. And this is one of the things that uh, William Rockham insisted, that science has this objective reality that you can get to by uh, getting rid of all the invisible stuff to get those hard nuggets of reality. And that still operates today, and it's the reason that science works. And although postmodernists have argued, really seriously argued, that science should be taught just like religion, or it could be taught like mysticism or, or anything in classrooms, Science has a big difference from those. If you believe in mysticism and maybe the people could travel around on flying carpets, if you went to the flying carpet conference, you'd get an aeroplane. You wouldn't fly on your flying carpet. The great thing about science is that it works. When, when the conferences on, on telepathy are organized, they don't do it through telepathy. They use the phone. <laughs> they use computers. So the really important thing about science is that you can argue yourself philosophically up any kind of dead end of, of rubbishing science. But the fact is we depend on it. And we haven't depended on religion or any, or any other metaphysics or mysticism in the way that we depend on science. And science has largely been dependable. Look what it's done with COVID, that we've got a vaccine that has saved already millions of lives. So I don't think mysticism... Uh, can um, can be claim such a um, make such a claim. So I think that's that's what we've got to do is not get stuck down arguments. Look and see what science does. Right, and that means the uh, sort of communal nature of science. That is to say, I have to get out of my skull to see if I haven't gone down some crazy rail and d deluded myself. But I can I can send you my ideas and say, what do you think? It, is there anything to this? And then you go check it. You check my math or you look out the window to see if you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing when I look up or whatever. And, and, and so that empiricism part means I have to not just convince you by good arguments, you have to be able to run the experiment or, or do the observations yourself. And if you come up with something pretty close to what I got, mm -hmm. then that increases our confidence that it's probably right. And, and since I'm on that subject, um, uh, you, you know, we, you talked about Bayes, you know, Bayes as a form of Bayesian reasoning as a form of simplicity. Uh, here, I've been thinking a lot about how scientists actually work. You know, it, it, 
for a long time, people thought, well, they're, they're Popperian. They're trying to falsify their hypotheses, which to me applies to absolutely no scientists I've ever met. <laughs> you know, they're, they'd really like to confirm their hypotheses. They have a, they have a hypothesis or yeah, theory. They're reasonably they're... confident. They collect more data. The data, if the data supports it, their, their kind of confidence in the probability of it being true goes up. Or if it doesn't, it goes down, which is a Bayesian kind of way of thinking, not Popperian where you're trying to falsify things. How do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm an experimentalist and in, in my work, and although I go into the lab these days very much, except to talk to my colleagues. Um, but I know uh, when I remember you set up some hypothesis and you do some experiment and then you go into... As you look at the result, often for us it was look, going into a dark room and seeing a picture of a gel or something like this, and it doesn't support your hypothesis. You don't immediately abandon your hypothesis. Your mind starts to think, ah, well, maybe I didn't add the enzyme. Maybe this didn't work, or that didn't work. Or maybe it's not quite this. It might be something very close to it. You don't abandon it. You just, as you say, in a, in a Bayesian kind of reasoning way, you knock, knock it down a notch in terms of its... Um, um, its likelihood of being true, and um, and then it might go up again, and it might go down again, and it's that's how science scientists generally work, and we know that disproving is impossible because many things that have been disproved has then been proved. Uh, uh, it was said several decades ago that epigenetic, sorry, that uh, uh, Lamarckian inheritance, the inheritance of acquired characteristics, had been disproved by experiments in the early part of the twentieth century. And now we call it epigenetics, this inheritance of, Lamar of this Lamarckian inheritance of acquired characteristics. The things that have been disproved can end up being proved uh, later. And the reverse can happen, of course. So there's no certainty of proof and disproof. Another example is that the um, something called the cosmological constant that Einstein invented to try to fit his general theory of relativity to a, what he thought was a, a steady state universe. And he, um, and then when it was discovered that the universe was expanding, he could abandon that and said it was a worse mistake in his life. So, and then it's come back because we found that the expansion is is uh, accelerating. So now we do have a cosmological constant again. So first you had it, then you didn't, and now you have it again. Where's the proof and disproof in all of this? So it isn't. It's it's a myth that uh, science works by move, uh, proof and disproof. It works like. Everything else in life, that's how we make sense of the world generally. You know, I, I, one of the examples I, I gave is when, when you're on a, um, on a date and your date doesn't turn up, you immediately don't conclude, oh, well, she stood me up. You kind of say, oh, well, maybe she missed the bus or, or maybe she had a phone call or maybe this and maybe that. That's how we do, that's how we deal with uh, uh, things in the, in the real world. We kind of try to obfuscate to a certain extent and if we're being proved wrong on something that's dear to us we don't immediately abandon it we try our best to keep our hypotheses and um, and then they just go up and down as things become likely and unlikely or more and more likely and unlikely in a Bayesian sense and I'm now convinced that all of science in fact a good deal of human reasoning is really Bayesian um, just looking at probabilities and in Bayesian probability Occam's razor is there Basically, Bayesian, the Bayesian inference method is a prior, what you think about the world at the moment, plus Occam's razor. That's basically what it is. And scientists have lost track, lost sight of that. And it's become so ingrained, this principle that um, this is what you, this is, uh, that scientists take simple solutions, that they don't really realize they're doing them, doing it. And they, many scientists say, oh, I don't believe in Occam's. I take, uh, you know, the world is complicated. That isn't what Occam's razor says. It doesn't say anything about the world. It says something about your reasoning about it. If you have several explanations that all make sense, you choose the simplest. And this is what science does, but no other way of thought, of reasoning about the world, uses Occam's razor, um, is, is uh, always committed to Occam's razor, which science is. No scientist would accept a simple would accept a complicated solution to a problem if a simpler one would do the job. And this is what uh, science is all about. Yeah, well, we're on the philosophy of science. Of course, we reject the hypothesis that it's angels that are keeping the moon going around the Earth. Now we say it's gravity. 
how do you get around the circu circularity of this argument? Well, what is gravity? It's the tendency for things to be attracted to one another. Well, why are they attracted to one another? Well, because of gravity. Well, what is gravity? I mean, it's not like a magnetic force where you see the little iron filings moving toward it, and we know there's a field there. Or is it? <laughs> and, you know, Newton famously, you know, was challenged on this and said, you know, I feign no hypotheses. I, I'm not saying I know what it is, only that we're using that word. So back to Wittgenstein, it's a word. So is it really fair to say about the ancients, well, this, they had this crazy idea about angels, but now we know better with gravity. Are, are you sure that's, that's a good way to put it? Yeah, it is an interesting point. I think um, uh, the the where gravity beats angels is that um, gravity works pulling apples off trees as well as moving um, planets and, and the moon around the sky. So uh, gravity is more economical. It's a single explanation and it's more predictable. You can put, write an equation about it, which you couldn't for an angel. So it's something that's scientific in that sense. But what gravity is, I mean, Newton thought it was one thing, but wasn't particularly sure because he found it a little bit suspicious that it has acts across distance, across a distance through a vacuum, through the vacuum of space. Einstein uh, describes it as um, um, curvature of space time. But what's that? Curvature of space time is a pretty weird idea anyway. I think ultimately there are some things that you come to which you can't kind of go behind them and say, at least you might be able to, but there will be, you know, what's an electron, ultimately? Um, it's a charged particle. What do we mean by charge? Something that pushes other objects around. Why does it do that? What makes it have that property? I don't know. It's just something that has this property. So I think some things where we come on the bedrock of our universe, which doesn't necessarily have causes. Why do we have electrons in the universe? There's no cause that we can think of other than that that's the universe that we've got and we've just got to try to make sense of it. So this drive to kind of think that um, there was a, there's a, some ultimate explanation is like in the medieval world, the prime mover argument that there must be a prime mover of things. No, there might not be. Some things may be brutally present in the world and there's no cause for them. There's no underlying reasoning behind them. It's just the way the world is. Interesting, right. So if I get this right, maybe we're hitting, at some point you hit an epistemological wall. There's just limitations of the size of our brain or our concepts or whatever. We just can't simply know. So we stipulate that's just the way it is. Gravity exists or, 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 or I don't know, let's say um, consciousness doesn't have an explanation. It never will. It's just, it just exists. It's just part of the universe. Uh, almost like asking, why is there something rather than nothing? Well, on one level, it's like, well, w what would nothing even include? Nothing would have to include not only no matter, mm. space, time, energy, whatever, but no concepts. Not even the concept of nothingness can exist in nothing. And at some point, I feel like when I'm thinking about these yeah. things, like a, theolo a medieval theologian, you know, arguing about transubstantiation, does the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ? Or are we just talking metaphorically? What are we even talking about? Mm. I mean, what do these words mean? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that is, a pro I think if you try to apply too much philosophy to science, you kind of hit, hit a dead end. Uh, you know, the speed of light, that, that's something that I found always bizarre. Why is the speed of light a limit on, 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 on travel in the universe? Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. It's not given by any science. There's nothing that predicts it, but it's just the way it is. And if it was any different, the world would be very different. But it makes sense. It's the only way we can, only way we can make sense of you know, electricity working in different time frames and, and, uh, and, and motion frames. Uh, is for the speed of light to be the same. And it is. And why that is, nobody knows. But the world would be incomprehensible without it. So I kind of think that the fact of our being here means that matter has got to exist, means that electric fields have got to exist. All of these things exist. And their existence is probably nothing we can ever explain. And consciousness could be something like that, that it is something 
that just exists and um, uh, doesn't have an explanation. I still think we can try to make some sense of it in terms of saying why does it exist in our brain and not in in the table or the chair or, or whatever. We still can ask questions about it, just as we can ask why are some objects electrically charged and some not. So we can ask those kind of questions. But the brute existence of the minimum components that we need for us being here, I think we'll probably never be able to answer. You know, matter, energy, time, etc. I don't think we'll ever get, uh, get around to providing an explanation of that. I think that's probably right. You discuss the uh, anthropic principle, the cosmological anthropic principle in your book. Uh, Frank Tipler uh, co-authored that book, and then he wrote another book after that, the, the Physics of Immortality. I don't know if you, you read that one. It, it's it's really quite no, I the. Read that one. Uh, yeah. It's an Aquinas kind of argument where, you know, he has this sort of series of things that if this is true and this is true and this is true and and he ends up at God, and the way he does this is he okay. he has uh, all the, the the kind of fine tuning arguments, the, the you know the relationship between the electron and the proton or the strength of gravity and electromagnetism and you know all these kind of fine tuned you know six numbers I think. Uh, 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 Professor Reese talked about in his book, just six numbers explains the entire universe. But someone like uh, uh, you know, like you and I would just say, well, that's just the way it is. That's the universe we have. If it wasn't like that, we wouldn't be here asking that question. But for someone like Frank Tipler, uh, he wants to to kind of make that theological move. Well, hang on, why should it be that way and not some other way? There has to be somebody tuning the knobs at the very beginning of time. And then he carries it out and says, well, it, you know, if you take Moore's law of doubling of computing power and so on and so forth, take that out 50,000 years or 5 million years or whatever, you, you'll have a virtual reality in which every person who ever lived, could have lived, is replicated in this virtual reality, and that's the resurrection. And now all of a sudden he's talking Christian dogma, and it's like, wait, how do you derive mm. that from physics? You know, and, and anyway, this is a little bit of a sidebar, so you yeah, talked yeah. about that. Uh, the anthropic principle. It, it is a curious it thing why the universe of, is that way. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, you can put a theological stopper <laughs> in, in your reasoning, but then that theology, a theological stopper has to have a cause as well, or then you, or you've made a rule that doesn't apply to the stopper, and then that's illogical. Either I, if everything has a cause, um, uh, then God should have a cause as well. If you, if you, this is exactly Occam, Occam's argument as well. That if if uh, God doesn't need a cause, then the universe doesn't need a cause either. So um, it doesn't help uh, throwing theology in. And of, and of course, you can. I think I've heard of this Tipper argument before, although I haven't haven't read the book. And it strikes me as is kind of what well, in some reasoning, some parts of reason, you can go into bizarre places, but they're very very shaky at every step. And, uh, I think um, um, they could go in a lot of other directions would, that would make a lot more sense than uh, uh, what you've described for Hitler's resurrection. Oh, he has a, a, a sequel to that called The Physics of Christianity, where he actually has a theory about the resurrection and Jesus' ascension to heaven after, you know, after the crucified, oh, and, but with okay. a beam of neutrinos that was like, it, it, or something about his entire body <laughs> dissolved in neutrinos and those went up into the heavens or Anyway, it's, it's 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 quite the thing, but um, what why so he talking is a about simplicity? Why, That's how they raise them. Yes, he's a medievalist totally. <laughs> uh, what why is God an, as an explanation not not an Occam's razor kind of thing? It's just God did it. That's the way it is. How sim how much simpler can you get? Well, God has to. God doesn't provide any any simplification. Um, because God has got to be as, at least as complicated as the universe, because he's made the universe. He or she has made the universe. So it doesn't really, um, we can't imagine a simple being like an electron, say, making the entire universe and still call it God. It's, it just doesn't make sense. But the other way, it's it, it, you can use Bayesian arguments for it, because um, you can kind of say that, well, if, if uh, we accept the theological explanation for the universe, then um, does it explain anything? What you do in, in using Occam's razor in Bayesian reasoning, you say, okay, here's the way the universe is. 
there are a number of ways of explaining it. One is, say, the Big Bang and standard model of particle physics. And that constrains the universe into a tiny space of, of possibilities. And, and that is when you do Bayesian reasoning. That's what gives a theory a high probability of being true. If it constrains the, the data in some way, it says, this could happen, but not that. Whereas God allows anything. God can make the universe any way he or she likes. So it doesn't constrain at all. And in a Occam's razor, Bayesian Occam's razor, it would have a very low probability compared to a theory that actually predicts the universe the way it is. God can make it in any kind of way. But uh, the Big Bang and general relativity and quantum mechanics make these predictions. And they're very tight predictions. So when, um, when the uh, experiments were done to look for very faint quantum mechanical signatures, or say the Higgs boson, that was, that was discovered through Higgs and other scientists at the time, looking at the equations of quantum mechanics and saying, we need this. And they went into, the, into CERN and found it. And it had, did have the properties exactly as expected. Now, if you believe in God, it doesn't make those kind of predictions. There's nothing that God predicts because God could do anything. So in terms of uh, um, explaining our world, it doesn't really work as an explanation because you could explain any world. When I talk about explaining something, I kind of say, well, you've got to explain why it is the way it is. And God doesn't do that because God could make anything. He could, he could make the world work in which, uh, you know, the, the world of Lord of the Rings work, for example, in which we have magic and things like this. That's all explicable. That all, all could be something that a divine being could do. But we have rules. And the theories that we have fit within those rules and make predictions that we can test. God doesn't, so it doesn't really work as an explanation of anything. Right, it's more of a post-diction. We're looking at a certain complexity, the eye or the yeah. bacterial flagellum or DNA. And after the fact, oh, well, that's the way, uh, it, that could only have come about because of God's intervention. But what you're saying is that, well, if it came out some other way, it wasn't DNA, it was RNA or some other self-replicating mo molecular structure, the theist would say, well, that's the way God did it. And so there's no constraint in your predictions of the way an alternative counterfactual exactly. world could be and then just to put a fine point on this so when a, a non-physicist like me looks at the the standard model in physics and, and, and i'm just baffled by all the different you know quarks and and the charms and the ups and downs and you know the subatomic particles and all this stuff it just looks bafflingly complex to me but you're not talking about simplicity or complexity of the world but the constraint that the theories put on it and the, the, the fewer elements in the theory to explain what we're observing is what you mean by simplicity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, Occam's razor in the sense that uh, I'm using it doesn't make any claim on the complexity of the world. Um, but strangely, we can write an equation which would, uh, of particle physics, the equations of particle physics, on the side of a mug. And you can buy these mugs. And these, this is the equation of particle physics that can account for all of the, all of the re interactions that take place in the universe, and that's an extraordinary simplicity. Now, for me, for me, like you, I'm not a, a physicist or a mathematician. This is a complicated equation, and I can't make sense of it. And it's kind of like also when people discovered quantum mechanics or general relativity. Oh, that complicated equation wasn't it easier with Newtonian mechanics, for example? That was simple. I could understand that. But the uh, general relativity, no, quantum mechanics, whew, I don't really understand this stuff. So it must be complicated. But the fact is that there are phenomena that if you try to explain them in Newtonian physics, like, say, black holes or the bending of, of uh, light by large objects, it would be a lot more complicated. In order to make sense of them, you have to have a different set of rules. And yes, that might be more, that might be more complicated than Newton. Newtonian physics, but these phenomena tell you that the world is a little bit more complicated than Newtonian physics, and it has these other features. And without general relativity or quantum mechanics to make sense of them, if you try to make sense of them in classical theories, it would be a whole heap more complicated. 
So these, although complicated to us, they're actually simple theories for many theoreticians and physicists who can get their head around them and say, you can buy a mug with the uh, theories of particle physics uh, painted on the side. So it is really simple, but for um, amateurs like us, it's too hard. So an example of this might be the perturbation of Mercury's orbit, which puzzled scientists until Einstein came along and explained it through relativity. Uh, a Newtonian explanation for Mercury's orbit would be way more complex than what Einstein offered. Yeah, people were talking about uh, having another planet there that was unseen and uh, um, or changing Newtonian physics in some strange way. So, yeah, exactly that. That once you get hints of another kind of science going on, then you may have to change your set of rules. Um, because, and you change them, when the other options are more complicated than the new set of rules. So if trying to account for the, um, the irregularities of the orbit of Europe, Mercury through Newtonian physics, the way of dealing with that was more complicated than introducing new, uh, um, Einstein's relativity. Um, so that's really when science makes a big jump forward often the world seems to be getting more complicated and someone says, hey, actually, we can make this a lot simpler by this. And then this extra facet of the world that we hadn't realized suddenly makes sense within a simple system. That's really how science, the big changes in science, the big revolutions in science have always been of that nature, that we take some complicated thing that doesn't make sense and suddenly we find another set of rules that does. And we've still got work to do on that. At the moment, general rel relativity and quantum mechanics don't make sense with each other. And I think the next great challenge in, in physics is, is finding another set of rules that makes sense at both the cosmological scale where general relativity works and the microscopic scale where quantum mechanics works. And that will be a single set of rules that will cover both both scales and that's going to be a simplification and that will be the sign that we really move forward in our understanding of uh, of how the universe works yeah i'm fine when i deal with people that believe in the paranormal and the supernatural and they they use words like that or esp or psi or whatever uh, you know i point out well those are just words you're not actually explaining anything it's like when cosmologists talk about dark energy and dark matter they don't invoke those words as the explanation. They're, they're just using the words as a placeholder until they can figure out what it is. It's neutrinos or whatever. Uh, and and mm -hmm. then they'll you know kind of bore down into a, a deeper explanation. So uh, again, back to the language problem, you know, scientists, you know, they, they, they just, we have to use words to talk <laughs> and communicate our ideas, but we don't necessarily mean those, mm -hmm. those words as explanations. Uh, okay, so let's hark harken back to no, uh, Occam. Uh, Occam and his razor and it kind of frees science up and then so we go to copernicus now um you know it's often it's sort of the cardboard version of that uh his system his heliocentric system was much simpler than the ptolemaic system but as everybody likes to point out after that well actually uh a copernican system would have as many epicycles to explain uh the motions of the planets as as uh, ptolemy so it's not simpler but if, if I read you right, what you mean is to say is his theory explains more of the anomalies. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many epicycles there are. And once you have Kepler with elliptical orbits, the epicycles go away. Um, it, but but at, at Copernicus's time, um, it was a simpler explanation that accounts for more of the observations. Would that be the way to put it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think... Um, and this, the postmodernists have really gripped, got hold of this kind of stuff and use it to try to undermine science as a, as a, um, as a discipline. And they point out, well, Copernicus, he had lots of epicycles, and he did because he fixed, he, he remained fixed on the idea of uh, of perfect circles. The orbits had to be perfect circles, and the motion of the planets had to be uh, constant, and that. Um, wasn't the reality, so he had to put extra epicycles in, and when you add those up, you get a similar number of epicycles than Ptolemy. But actually, if you draw them out, 
these epicycles of Copernicus were tiny little things. Um, yeah, and in my book, I do draw them out. Uh, you can go onto a program online and it will give you a geocentric path of Venus, say, and a heliocentric path of Venus. And the geocentric path of Venus goes whoosh, 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 whoosh round in all sorts of epicycles. And if you go to the heliocentric, then suddenly it's a circle. And it isn't actually a circle, it's a slight ellipse. But it doesn't make a lot of difference. But the other, other thing, and really the thing that convinced De Copernicus and later um, uh, astronomers, was there were kind of nonsense things. If you go for the geocentric, there were kind of weird things that happened, like planets would move this way, and then they'd turn around and move back, and then they'd carry on like this. Now, how do you explain that with circles? You can't, really. Well, you did. That Ptolemy did. He put circles within circles within circles. Those dropped out of it when um, the heliocentric model was brought in. It was actually just one planet overtaking another one, moving in the same direction, but one was moving faster, and that caused the switch. So that made sense, and it didn't make at all sense in the geocentric system. Similarly, in the geocentric systems, um, the orbit of Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus, they had a period in them of an Earth year. Now, why was that? If, if the Earth was at the center, everything else was rotating around, why should they bother having a period in there circling around the Earth? It has the same period as the Earth year. It just doesn't make any sense. That drops out when you move to the heliocentric system. That period just gets absorbed in the heliocentric system. It's no longer there anymore. And it's gone. So it's getting rid of the anomalies. And this is what impressed astronomers like Kepler afterwards, Tycho Brahe, and uh, Newton. It wasn't, they didn't count epicycles. They said, look, this one makes sense. The other one doesn't. All these epicycles twirling around in the sky, kind of Catherine wheels turning around in the sky. You don't need those anymore. And you don't have planets doing weird stuff anymore. And you don't have peculiar features like Mars having a period in its going around a little circle that keeps time with the Earth. It just doesn't make sense. So this is where the simplicity gain is. There's a lot of stuff that which this so complicated to explain in the geocentric system and they didn't need explanation in the heliocentric system they were just a part of the system and suddenly it became a lot simpler so don't count the epicycles look at the reasoning of the two systems much simpler in their heliocentric yeah i loved your discussion of tico brahe he's a, one of the fascinating characters in the history of science particularly because of his modified a model in which the sun is the center of all the planets going around it and that entire system then goes around the earth <laughs> i forget if there he had more or less uh epicycles yeah. but but that one didn't take it didn't take but it's actually interesting and it actually comes to a very interesting and in, in, in point because in fact you could say he was right because in general relativity you can take any point as your frame of reference so you mm. can take the earth as being the center and what you do, if you do that, is you get Tycho Brahe's system. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in general relativity, but it's a whole lot more complicated. The only reason for having the heliocentric system, because in, of course in space there's no center anywhere. You can stick your center anywhere you like. But if you make your center the Earth, then the motions become more complicated. If you make your center the sun, because it's the most massive by far object in the solar system, then the motions become much simpler to describe. So really the switch from uh, geocentric to heliocentric, it has this simplicity gain because simply because the sun is a much more, is a much huger uh, object and it dominates the motions of the, of the, um, of the solar system. It's like, trying to explain all the motions on a ship, uh, which you can do from the frame of the shore. But everything that happens is happening in an object that's moving, and it's very complicated to explain. Jump on the ship, and suddenly it becomes a lot easier to explain because most objects aren't moving. 
And that's what it's like in shifting from the geocentric to the heliocentric system. You're jumping on the biggest object of the in the solar system, and suddenly that makes the everything else much simpler because you've cancelled out its motion. Right. It's so hard to grasp some of those thought experiments, like Einstein's one with the, the two lightning bolts that hit the ground at the same time to the observer standing here. It mm -hmm. looks like they hit at the same time. So that's the reality. And then Einstein says, okay, close your eyes and put yourself on a train and you're moving in the direction of one of the lightning bolts and away from the other lightning bolt. What are you going to see? And, uh, you know, and the answer is, well, they're not going to hit at the same time. Well, they either hit at the same time mm -hmm. or they don't. No. <laughs> and it's like, wait, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. So that kind I, of, I find those examples... They're very hard. I, I find I have to go through them very carefully, and then I go, yes, you're right. And then next day I've forgotten the reasoning because it's kind of hard to <laughs> right. get your head around it. But it does make sense. <laughs> yes. And, um, and at the time that you go through it, it's suddenly aha. You get a aha moment. But it's a transient aha for me, and I have to go through it again very carefully yes. to understand. Although we should probably but point out that there. Einstein had a lot of good – he had a, good, a lot of good math behind those thought experiments because I get – I get these alternative theories of everything, I call them, from fringe people. Just people that say, you know, I've worked out the, all these hard problems and I've unified all, all of physics, you know, in my garage by myself and I have no training. Uh, and look, that's what Einstein did. It's like, no, that's not what Einstein did. First of all, he had training. Second of all, he published in major German physics journals, mainstream journals that were peer-reviewed. And yes, he was working at a patent office, but only because he didn't have, he couldn't get a job because there weren't many jobs. And uh, it's not like if you and I have a dream about uh, riding on a beam of light, we're going to, you know, revolutionize physics. You got to actually have the math behind it. So ultimately it comes down to that kind of mathematical constraints on the theory and, and its predictability from there. Yeah. And it comes down to the point you were making earlier, Michael, that you and I can agree if we were both scientists working in the area of general relativity, then we um, or working in the area of trying to understand gravity and uh, at the time of Einstein, then we'd both read Einstein's paper and say, wow, he solved the problem. So we can agree. And lots of people agree that, and people uh, say it's tough to um, it's tough to make sense of. But uh, a lot of people did make sense of it. And then we agree. And this is what science is ultimately based on. You can have any idea that you like and prove it to your own satisfaction, but if you can't prove it to other people, it's not worth a penny. And yes, you may have a great idea. I, I like you, get people like, oh, I've solved this and solved that. I say, write a scientific paper and then convince everyone. If you really got a great idea, you can write a paper, you can submit it to a journal and get it published. And then you might be able to convince people. And say, oh, it's hard. Yes, it is hard. It was hard for Einstein in the patent office to write a scientific paper, but he did it. And if you're really brilliant and you solve these problems, then that's what you've got to do. Convince everyone else. It's not enough to convince yourself. Yeah, we're also uh, witnessing the survivorship bias, as it's called. We're looking at the winners, the ones that turn out to be right. You know, the Galileos and Newtons and Einsteins. Well, what about all the no-names that had uh, interesting ideas? Like most people don't mm -hmm. know about Tycho Brahe. You know, what about him? How come that one didn't win out? And, you know, there's a thousand Galileos. We never heard of them because they, you know, their ideas were wrong. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You can have a brilliant ideas. I've had many brilliant ideas. Most of them have turned out to be wrong. So, yeah, it's that's the way of things. As I think uh, Dawkins uh, said something like, uh, however many ways there, be, there are to be alive, there's certain there's a lot more to be dead. And similarly for reasoning, however many ways there may be to be right there's a lot more to be wrong so most theories are wrong and you probably don't discover it till fairly late on and uh, so it takes a good deal of reasoning and hard work before you really find out whether it's wrong and it isn't right or wrong in the end as we were saying before it's only a level of probability you, you make it more probable that your theory is right prove to everyone that it, uh, it fits the data yeah, they laughed at the Wright brothers. Yeah, well, they laughed at the Marx brothers. Being laughed at doesn't mean you're right. <laughs> you actually have to be right, or at least have a better theory. Yeah, so, you know, in these alternative theories of physics, 
Um, I, I don't get too many of these, maybe one a month or every couple of months, but I know famous physicists and, and cosmologists, they get them every day. And, uh, you know, one of the things they they yeah. tell them, or you just, I think Michio Kaku actually has a web page to go to, you know, your alternative theory has to meet these things here that are already explained by the current theory and the anomalies over here that the current theory doesn't account for. So if you want to be accepted, you can't just say, I can explain that one little weird anomaly there. That's not enough. You have to, what about all these other things that we already know about now? And uh, that most, you know, most people can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I know it's physicists who kept this most. My colleague, Jim Al-Khalili, oh, yeah. that is every day he's saying that they've solved. Oh, I'm sure he does because he's on TV. Yeah. wrong? Right, right. Einstein or something. Yes, once you're on TV, you everyone everyone wants to write to you to tell you how um, they've discovered the answer. Life, the universe, and everything. That's right. <laughs> hey, Douglas Adams. So uh, let, let's zip forward. So Copernicus, Galileo. Newton, we have kind of a unification and a simplification of the physical sciences. Uh, I've been kind of rethinking some of my ideas on the Enlightenment. I think of the Enlightenment as attempts by people like David Hume, uh, Adam Smith, and others inspired by Newton and this whole unification, simplification process applied to the biological sciences, the social sciences. You know, when you read Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, you know, it's taught in political science courses as, you know, kind of what the founding document of modern political theory. But in fact, it's a, it's a kind of a materialistic psychology that goes all the way down to, you know, like particles in motion bouncing off each other. And from that, we derive thoughts and so on. He's got a whole psychology, this, this kind of materialistic psychology. And I tend to think of, you know, these Enlightenment philosophers are trying to do what the physical scientists did. And, and, and now I'm kind of rethinking it. It's really more of an an Occam's razor kind of approach. We have this massive complex system, a political system, an economy. How in the world do you explain this? And what these guys are doing is saying, let's see if we can find half a dozen laws that explain all of this sea of, of, of information we're looking at. Yeah, I think um, it kind of, you kind of can bring it back to, is there an urge to get back to say the medieval worldview, where there was one set of laws, one world, religion, science, everything was all within this stuff. And I think then that shattered. Suddenly science went off on another limb and started doing these things that God became less and less involved in until it completely vanished. And many philosophers, I think by the Enlightenment, it was a, aha, we can, okay, we've got this mechanistic stuff. And there were many philosophers at the time who said, OK, we can get back to that medieval way of bringing God into the argument as well. And many of the medieval philosophers did that in terms of uh, people like Descartes and, and others who, who still had God within the centre. Hobbes was different, a uh, beast from Bolsover or somewhere he was, wasn't he? Uh, he, 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 tried, he tried to remove, uh, um, like Ockham, he tried to remove uh, uh, God from the arguments. But a lot of philosophers didn't in the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment has that peculiar mix of uh, of theology, and it was really when science. Uh, I remember that scientists were at the time called natural philosophers, so their discipline was really more of a philosophy. So they were taught to think like philosophers, and their aim in philosophy, I think, is always to find a single kind of way of describing everything in the world. That's what philosophers do. Whereas scientists say, "No, I'll I'll describe this tree or this atom," and that's enough for me but philosophers say I, I want to explain everything and that was what the medieval scholars tried to do and that attempt was abandoned in the medieval world picked up again to a certain extent in the enlightenment and then i think lost lost interest in that idea now people are thinking about it again trying to say trying to come up with big ideas for how to explain the universe being the way it is and uh, what happened before the Big Bang and those kind of things. We're trying to bring it back in in terms of providing a final explanation of everything. Not sure if it's ever going to be successful, but it is an interesting kind of way of thinking. There's this uh, philosophical way of trying to provide a world theory, if you like. It's going to account for everything, including human beings, ethics, and everything else. And um, in a scientific view, well, no, I'm going to an apple falling from a tree. That's enough for me. 
Right. Hobbes uh, actually referenced uh, Galileo and Harvey. Harvey discovering the circulation of blood in the body. And, and then that was picked up by some early economists. That, again, that word wasn't even used at the time. Um, political economy, I think it was called. And uh, thinking of like currency flowing through a nation is like blood flowing through a body. And diseases that interrupt the flow of blood in a body are equivalent to you know bad government policies that interrupt the flow of currency in a in a nation, mm-hmm. you know. And Adam Smith's famous book is you know it's always just called the the wealth of nations, but its its actual title is on the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. You know, he was trying to give an expo. Well, what are we talking about? What is wealth anyway? What is that? How do we define it in an operational way that mm-hmm. we can measure it and and then figure out what the cause of it is? And you know, in this sense. Uh, poverty doesn't need an explanation. That's that's what you get when you do nothing. <laughs> you know, wealth needs an explanation. Where does mm-hmm. it come from? And but all of that was inspired. I mean, uh, uh, Adam Smith was a you know a professor of political philosophy. I think it was his title. Uh, but he also was a moral philosopher. You know, his first book was on the moral sentiments. And again, going back to this this kind of materialistic psychology of Hobbes. You know, these sort of particles in motion that's in our brain. Uh, you know, humans are uh, are driven by, you know, positive emotions and, and away from negative emotions, pleasure and pain. And then all of a sudden he's talking about the state of nature and without government, you know, people are just nasty, brutish and short. Life is nasty, brutish and short because people are selfish. They need some kind of structure, a, a moral, legal structure around them. That's the Leviathan. And all of a sudden he's talking political philosophy where 10 chapters before he was talking physics, just particles in motion. This is mm. this is what you're talking about. Is like we're, 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 you just have a single unified theory that explains everything in in, in between two book covers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, I think that was the aim in the medieval world and the, in the Enlightenment to try to uh, recover that with science being the the explanation of everything. And this is what Hobbes tried to do with the particles in motion from Descartes and and explaining everything. And I think he, he got as far as anyone got at that time to kind of trying to remove move theology out of it, saying we don't really need God, we just have these particles in motion. If God is there, he was some kind of being made of matter like everything else. And, um, and wanting to explain everything and uh, to account for everything in the world. And that's, um, um, that's we've lost, I think, in science. And um, there's no one who will try to do something like that, except, as you said, the kind of crackpot ideas of people who will try to put everything together. But now we, we kind of accept that there are different sets of rules to govern uh, people as there are to govern electrons. And um, we're not anywhere near explanations that could kind of go from the particle level up to explaining how politics work worked and I think this is what people like Hobbes tried to do was take that kind of concepts at the lower level and say well let's throw them in and see if they can explain the economy and they make a darn good attempt at it but ultimately it doesn't work because there are different forces in motion they may have some uh, superficial resemblance um, to circulation of blood and things like this too um, uh, but it's all it's only superficial and there's so many layers between particle physics and, and big stuff. Uh, physicists, uh, I work in, in an area of quantum biology, and there we have this um, um, uh, conflict, if you like, between physicists who don't want to uh, model anything bigger than, you know, half a dozen atoms. And that more than that is, is, is far too complicated. So we can't really go up from that level. We're, we're so far away from it. That's, you know, physicists can make accurate models of very small things, but they can't make accurate models of large things. So we have to go to different sets of rules that ultimately depend on the fundamental physics. But we can't take those rules up to that level. They just become too complicated. And we have to go for a simpler set of rules that are an approximation to what's going on. They will ever have that kind of certainty that uh, particle physics has. But um, they will give us a good pro- approximation. So all of science above particle physics is making approximations 
appropriate for the level of complexity that they're dealing with. And I guess that's what and that's so far away from being that vision of a single set of rules um, oh, that it just doesn't make sense anymore. Um, ultimately, there must be a single set. You know, you can have, as I said, you can have the um, equations of particle physics printed on your on your coffee mug, but you can't use them to explain economy. And there's just too many steps in, right. in between. Right. Um, yeah, I use this example. I was on a panel discussion with Brian Green and a few other physicists the other day, and and uh, you know Brian was touting the power of quantum physics and, and so on. And so my, one of my examples of, of is emergent properties of systems that are completely different. Like how how would you study unemployment? You know, using physics, you can't. It's, it mm. doesn't exist. It's it's an emergent property of, uh, of large macro people. You know, making uh, exchanges in an economy, mm. and you know the unemployment derives from it, or whatever. I think of consciousness like that too. You know, there's all these attempts to explain consciousness at the quantum level. You're probably familiar with quantum consciousness, this theory that um, uh, mm. that you know Roger Penrose and and uh, Stuart Hameroff has is that inside neurons are these uh, these little microtubule structures that uh, are like scaffolding of the cell, and inside there you could get these. Uh, I guess at the micro level of these kind of quantum effects. Uh, of the subatomic particles inside the atoms, inside the microtubules of the neurons, and that. So uh, I'm going to oversimplify the theory here, but you know, I have a thought, and and that the the quantum uh, collapse of the of the wave field of the quantum effects inside my neurons go through the field into your skull, and so you can, you know, detect my my thoughts or whatever. This is the idea of one explanation for ESP that doesn't need an explanation because it doesn't exist. But if it did, it'd be something like quantum consciousness, I guess. Mm -hmm. So one of the rebuttals to this is that in a warm, mushy environment like a brain, the, the quantum effects would all cancel each other. They'd all wash out. And, and so you have to talk about it at a higher level, at the level of neurotransmitter substances, which are molecules, not subatomic particles. But then the counter I get to this is, no, no, there's new research in quantum biology now showing that quantum effects do happen in warm, mushy environments like a brain. Uh, but I, I, I haven't followed the track since then. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, ve I'm very familiar with this story. I met uh, Penrose and Hamalf and discussed uh, uh, these things. Because I, I have my oh, own good. theory of consciousness that, uh, oh, good. Um, that um, um, doesn't deal with quantum mechanics at all. Um, I believe that the Penrose Hammerhoff uh, came up with a remarkable kind of theory, but it doesn't make any sense at all. It's um, um, well, I, I also work in quantum biology. I, I, I run quantum director of a quantum biology doctoral training center here in the UK. I think the only one in the world. Um, so I, I'm familiar with quantum mechanics, and um, uh, I've been uh, doing work on quantum mechanics and and. And you're right that uh, now it's been discovered that quantum mechanics may be involved in things like photosynthesis, how plants capture light energy, maybe in, involved in birds being able to navigate around the globe, all of these kind of things. But when you look at the bit that's quantum mechanical, it's very small. It's, say, a single photosystem, which is, you know, maybe a thousand, a hundred or a thousand atoms. And really the bit that's doing the quantum mechanical stuff, is a vibrating electron. That's all it is that's doing the quantum mechanical stuff, and it may have some kind of quantum mechanical interaction with other vibrating e electrons, but probably only six or seven, something like that. And that's all the quantum mechanical stuff requires in order to deliver the photosynthetic evidence for quantum mechanics in biology. It's just a very localized, within a single molecule, or a large molecule, albeit, but a single molecule where this quantum mechanical stuff is happening. Similarly, there's evidence that enzymes may work by allowing uh, or promoting the motion of electrons, but single electrons across a gap that they could not otherwise jump across without quantum mechanics, or protons that can do the same. But it's inside a single enzyme molecule and only involving a single particle or a few particles that are doing this quantum mechanical stuff. Now, for the Penrose Hammerhoff idea to be true, they, they describe this as quantum mechanical microtubules, and these are scaffolding inside living cells. 
and they're the worst possible thing for quantum mechanics. They're complicated. They're operating inside a living cell. And the other thing that you need for quantum mechanics to, at a larger scale is for it to be either ultra cool or ultra still, or both really, ultra cool and ultra still. You've got to not move around because quantum mechanics, how you get things quantum coherent is objects are always constantly moving around. To make them quantum coherent, they need to be kind of stuck together like this or moving together. And if they move at different rates in different places, then you lose all of that. Microtubules are about the busiest molecules inside cells. They're always being polymerized and depolymerized. And the idea of them being quantum mechanical across their entire length for periods of time enough to encode a thought it just doesn't make sense. But what they have to be in order for the Penrose and our idea to be right is they have to be quantum mechanical across our entire brain. And there's nothing in quantum biology that is anything close to that. There's no quantum mechanical effect out that goes stretches from one cell to another. It's always maybe involving one or two molecules. Never mind within a cell, but within many cells, within millions of cells, for the penrose hamalf idea to be right, to stretch quantum coherence across the entire brain. It just doesn't make any sense at all. And no physicist would have, would have an idea of how you would make that work. So um, I don't... And actually, this is how I got interested in quantum... In, in my own theory of consciousness, because first of all, I thought, hey, that's a great idea. Um, and then I said, no, it's not. It doesn't work at all. And then I kind of got thinking about how consciousness works. And um, I came up with my own theory, and I've published many papers on this, the most recent last year in the, the journal, the Neuroscience of Consci Consciousness Journal. Uh, it's that the consciousness is just your brain's electromagnetic field. And this is where our consciousness sits. And it's... Uh, it's come from the idea that the only thing I got from the Penrose Hammerhoff idea was that you need some kind of field to unify stuff in the brain. Because when we look at an image like what I'm looking around in my room, it's all stuck together. The problem with the matter of the brain is it's all in separate particles. Now in quantum mechanics, what you can do is make all those particles work together as a single unit. But as I said, that's really hard when you have more than two or three, four, five, six particles, you can get them to work together. But otherwise, you have to cool things down to absolute zero and work in a vacuum on, a, on, a, um, on an optical table where you don't have any vibrations. And that's the only way you can get big stuff to work as a single unit. But you need some kind of field which unifies everything. And that's the brain's electromagnetic field. We, as well as the matter in the brain, we also have another physical stuff, the electromagnetic field in the brain. And it automatically unifies everything that goes on in the brain because everything gets reflected into the brain's electromagnetic field. So all of your ideas, all of your thoughts are all stuck together in the brain's electromagnetic field. And what's this sticking together? It's consciousness. That's all of the ideas in different parts of your brain stuck together to make the big ideas which operate the world. And that's, um, so that's my own theory. And as I said, I've published many papers on it most recently last Last year, Neuroscience of Consciousness. So happy to um, about that in more detail right, so, at another time. But um, so, so let me see if I get this right. So, so maybe it's fields on top of fields, or maps on top of maps, and you know the sort of global map that accounts for these maps, that accounts for those maps, in sort of a uh, kind of a clustering effect or something like this. And then, but you did a move there. You uh, you introduced the word uh, consciousness interchangeable with field and again back to the language problem mm -hmm. these are just these are words we're using uh, are you still yeah. using a reductionistic a model to get there or is it at some point it almost feels like and it then a miracle no, happens <laughs> no no it isn't it isn't i i, I think from i think what one way of thinking about it, this is is having a look at your mobile phone okay you look at a movie on the mobile phone okay Someone else at the other side, other end of the room could be looking at that same movie on the mobile phone. And someone else, someone else, someone outside could be looking at the same movie at the mobile phone. What's picking it up? It's a tiny antennae within your phone that's picking up this entire movie from the electromagnetic field. Now, if we shift from the phone to the electromagnetic field, we say, okay, where is that movie in the electromagnetic field? It's actually everywhere. 
That's why you can pick it up, I can pick it up, and everyone else who got access to this electromagnetic field can pick up this movie from any point in space. And this is what fields do. They unify stuff. Everything travels at the speed of light, so there's no time from the frame of the frame of the field from one place to another. There's no time and there's no space. So if you then say instead of this entire movie being there at the antennae, you've got all the thoughts of the brain because everything that happens in the brain involves generating an electrical disturbance. And that electro electrical disturbance gets reflected into the brain's electromagnetic field. And that automatically unifies it, just like the entire movie is unified in the antennae of a mobile phone and allows you to pick it up from any point in space. So your entire thoughts are unified at the antennae in your brain, which are on your neurons. As well as generating electromagnetic fields by their electrical activity, they're also sensitive to them as well, because neurons fire by disturbances across their membrane, electrical disturbances across their membrane. So as well as being transmitters, neurons are receivers, are aerials, if you like, antennae of electromagnetic fields. So they generate our thoughts and they pick up our thoughts. And that's where our thoughts lie then. Instead of the movie in the brain, we've got our thoughts that are being generated and transmitted across the entire brain yeah. at the speed of light to everywhere in the brain where every neuron can access it and pull it down and drive our actions. That to me makes much more sense than any other explanation of consciousness that I've mm -hmm. heard. It's just, and all you have to do is jump from matter to electromagnetic fields. It's just as physical, uh, field. but it's just a different right. kind of stuff. So this is a little bit like your discussion in your book about the introduction of the idea of, of fields, starting with electromagnetic fields, in which, um, it, you know, that electricity and magnetism are actually two sides of the same thing. You're, you're doing something like that. Now, if I could just take the analogy one step further. So uh, the, the movie streaming into the room right now from Apple TV or Netflix or whoever, we, we know who's generating those fields. They're sending them out. We know how they do it. What would be the equivalent of consciousness? Where Who's beaming out consciousness? Do you go back to just the neurons firing? Our brain You have is. to scale up from there? Yeah, neurons in a Gerdelian loop in that, uh, in that the neurons fire into the electromagnetic field and they pick up the electromagnetic field. So it produces that Gerdelian loop of, um, of information flowing in and out of the electromagnetic field. But when it's in the electromagnetic, when, it, when the information is in the matter, it's discrete, distributed across lots of different atoms in different parts of the brain. When it's in the field, it's unified because that's what fields do. The, you know, a photon in the electromagnetic field has the same level of unity as uh, a single um, photon anywhere. It's completely unified, and it's the electromagnetic field of the entire brain is to be unified within a single photon to carry all its information. So that's really where our thoughts seem to lie. And if you'd like, then you kind of get the closest I can get to an answer to the hard problem, as you say. Electromagnetic fields have two aspects to them, magnetism and electricity. Uh, two different aspects of electromagnetic fields. Is awareness another aspect of them? Is awareness just another, if you like, orthogonal angle? On, If you can say magnetism is in one direction, um, electrical forces, electrical forces in the other end, the right end rule or whatever it was in physics, but consciousness, awareness, maybe another angle on that ortho, on that right hand rule it's saying okay consciousness comes with this because what is consciousness it's information that's all joined up that's surely what an idea is it's an idea is lots of complicated information joined up so it's some indivisible little nugget where is that joining up going to happen it's not going to happen in the matter of the brain because matter is discrete it's spread all over the place but it happens automatically in the brain's electromagnetic field. Interesting. So we know the brain is pretty it. modular. So really joined up. The, the brain is pretty mm -hmm. modular. We have a lot of different neural networks doing different things. So over here on my temporal lobe in the fusiform gyrus, I have my facial recognition software. And over here in Broca's area, I have my language 
uh, network that uh, can can uh, understand words, and another part can speak the words, and on and fate, you know, on and on and on. You know, just a thousand different things are going on at any one time, ind- it seemingly independent of each other. So, how does your theory account for the the modularity of the brain as, uh, along with this general field? I'm even well, the first thing the right is question. that the low consciousness. I I think it is a, an interesting question. The firstly that um um. Consciousness only describes a trickle of what the brain does. Most of what the brain does doesn't involve, involve conscious consciousness. Me doing this when I'm talking, I'm not right. conscious of it. Right. Most, of, most of the complicated stuff that we do, like the motions of my lips to form words, it's an extraordinarily complex computation. It's got to be done by my brain to drive my lips and, and tongue and larynx. And I don't think about it at all. So all of that kind of stuff can operate as our, in our brain as standard computational architecture, but it doesn't come with consciousness. Yet we do are conscious of stuff, and the thing that makes the, what we talk about is consciousness. I, and I think lots of philosophers and neuroscientists agree now. It's integrated information. It's information that's kind of stuck together. So as when we look at something or when we have an idea, it's a very complex object, but it's existing within a single consciousness. And that's the key. Fields do that. Matter doesn't. This is a difference between matter and fields. Matter is discrete. It's localized in space. Fields aren't. They're delocalized in space, which means that they can be delocalized across our entire brain. So the electromagnetic field of our entire brain has the same level of unity as a single photon. It's completely unified. There is no way you can separate it into its parts. Now, the matter can be in those different units, as you say, it will do different things, different operational stuff like memory and motor motion movement. And ultimately, everything that we, all our conscious activity has got to go through those. And those work, I think, through the standard kind of neurochemical matter based computation that computers work. And that's all modularized exactly as you say, because that's the output. Consciousness is no good unless you can get it out. If it was just stuck in your brain, we wouldn't know about it, or at least we wouldn't be able to talk about it. The fact that matter of consciousness, the most important thing is we can talk about it. We can talk about our ideas. If we were a robot, we couldn't, because all its ideas are stuck all over the place. And that's why robots are dumb, because they don't have this conscious electromagnetic field stuff driving their, some of their actions. So most of what the brain does doesn't involve consciousness because most of it just operates through the wires like a computer operates. But then there's a small amount of our activity that's driven by small pushes and pulls of the electromagnetic field, which is our experience of consciousness and free will. Oh, okay. Well, let's see how far you want uh, you, you want to take this. Um, you know, someone like Deepak Chopra, you know, talks about um, you know consciousness as the ground of all being. It's everywhere. You you can't get underneath it. You can't bury down through quantum physics and find it in there. It's a it's a field, a giant field. Now he's not a super supernaturalist, paranormalist, ESP kind of guy, but there are people that grab that idea and say, well. This is how thought reading happens, or this is how I can connect with God or the spiritual world or whatever, is a field. My field is connected to your field or to the global field or something like that. How far can you go with that before it becomes just woo-woo crazy craziness? <laughs> yeah, not very far at all. But there is, there is something very intriguing, which I don't travel along this path at all, but, but since you push me in the corner and force me to uh, speculate in this direction. There is something interesting about the field, that uh, uh, electromagnetic field. The universe only has one of them. There's only one electromagnetic field for the entire universe. And that's kind of intriguing if, I, if as, as I'm saying, that the electromagnetic field of our brain is, uh, uh, is, is, is consciousness. Why is it I'm not getting everyone else's consciousness? And that is because... The, in order to perturb the neurons of your brain, the electrical disturbances just outside them have got to be strong enough to make a difference. So that's only going to happen to the local, only the local electromagnetic field 
will be able to perturb the brain. If, if you were sitting next to me in the room rather than being across the Atlantic, uh, I still couldn't, none of your electromagnetic field would affect the function of my brain. The only electromagnetic fields that affect the function of my brain is the stuff inside my head. But there is then that intriguing thing, which, yes, there is only one electromagnetic field. And what does that mean? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of these people who want to go along the chopper road of thinking about that other than saying, well, it's kind of intriguing. There is only one electromagnetic field. What does that mean if consciousness is an electromagnetic field? Uh, is it that the electromagnetic field has outputs at different points in space that are, 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 are human beings? Every human being is an output of the universe's single electromagnetic field, but it is one that's dominate, dominated by the matter-based stuff that's going on inside, going on inside everybody's head. As far as I can see, there's no way for somebody else's brain to influence how my brain would work from that theory. But it is intriguing. Yes. It, it, and here is about where people introduce the, the double slit experiment in physics and the spooky action at a distance. And somehow or another, the particles know what the other particles are doing. And they can be separated by galaxies or the other side of the universe or whatever, which would imply this... Mm. universal field that uh, we can all access um that i assume would, would would go further than you want to go but but go ahead and speculate about that and how you tie physics into that yeah yeah this is an entanglement and um yeah entanglement is a tricky thing i can't get, quite get my head around it's very mathematical in how it really works but it's ultimately we're entangled with things to the ends of the universe so we are entangled it's there is a kind of quantum field which the whole universe is part of and we have vibrations within this quantum field the very complicated vibrations but we are entangled with stuff way way out there you don't need to know that to explain how an apple falls from a tree or whatever so i think it's it comes down to this simplicity yes you can try to say okay well we're entangled tangled with everything so that must have some impact no not necessarily it uh, uh, you can explain an apple falling from a tree by just looking at the local stuff, and if you then can't explain it without having to go to some distant galaxy with this apple maybe entangled with, then I'll start thinking about your theory that there is one that it does make a difference. This idea of everything being entangled out to the ends of the ends of the universe. Yes, in theory it does. Does it make a difference to anything on Earth? Probably not. So I think that's it comes to, look, what do I need to explain the world? And I don't need to, to explain the stuff that happens on Earth, and I don't need to have recourse to entanglement going out to the ends of the cosmos uh, to do that. And similarly, with consciousness and everything that happens in my brain, I don't think I need recourse to think about what other people are thinking about, other than when they tell me about when they're thinking about it. Their thoughts themselves don't influence me, as I know. So uh, we get back to Occam's razor, deal with the laws and that give you the simple solutions to problems, and those don't take into account things that don't matter. Right, so different levels of analysis. I just thought of that, those uh, brain experiments where they put the magnet right up next to the brain and turn it on, and it turns off or turns on one of your neural networks and people report different things. But that has to be a really powerful magnet right up against the skull. And by the way, your cell phones are very weak, mm. so holding your phone up to your head is not going to cause brain tumors or whatever. Uh, yeah. But that would be an example of that. If, if it takes a huge magnet right next to my skull to affect my neurons, then how's, how's, how are your thoughts going to affect mine from 3,000 miles away? Can't. Okay. All right, exactly. John Joe, we've been going over an hour and a half. Let me just ask you one last question here, because this comes up a lot on the podcast because it's one of these eternal problems of free will and determinism. You know, you're a scientist. I assume you assume the world is determined. It's causal. All effects have causes and so on, except for the subatomic uh, uncertainty principle and all that stuff. Just take that out of the equation. Where does human free will come in, in, in your, if you thought about this, in your fields model or in some other way that you think about yeah. that? Um, I mean, I feel like I make choices. Uh, and, and, and you mentioned awareness. So I'm aware of the causal vectors pushing on me and pull, pulling me and 
and I can kind of tweak my own future by changing the conditions because I know future Shermer is going to act differently than current Shermer. So I'm going to not have the food in the ice box that I shouldn't be eating tonight, like ice cream, or I'm going to set out my workout clothes tonight because I know at five o'clock tomorrow morning, I'm not going to want to get up and I need all the help I can get. So who's doing that? I am. And am I not making a choice about my future? So therefore that's something like volition. Yeah, funnily enough, I've written a paper a bit about this. Uh, it was published again last year on um, in oh, okay, neuroscience. Do tell. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so back to the electromagnetic field. As I said, most of what the brain does, we're completely unaware of. It just happens without us having to think about it. But there is this trickle of stuff which is influenced by the brain's electromagnetic field. That is our will. That is what we experience as our will. Now, this business about determinism, I think it's it's kind it's um it's being confused by theology. Back to those theologians, those darn theologians of the of the medieval world. What they needed to do was to make us culpable for our actions. So they wanted they they believed that people were punished in hell for you know being tortured for all eternity. That's a pretty mean punishment if they did bad things, if they sinned. And that meant they had to be free. They couldn't say, because, you know, you could say, well, our, our God made them, he made them do this stuff. So why are you punishing them? Shouldn't you punish God? No, they said, no, they had free will. And we've stuck with this idea that free will is something that we do freely. But, you know, do we really have free will? I'm not sure that's how we experience what we're calling free will. I mean, I choose to raise my hand. Did I do it freely or did it do it because you asked me about free will a moment ago? If you hadn't asked me about free will a moment ago, I wouldn't have been thinking to do that. And that wouldn't have happened. Um, if we think about the things that we do by choice, do they ever come without a cause? I mean, that's what we're asking for free will to be non-deterministic. That is, is, is an action without a cause. When I think, okay, I'm going to phone my brother, is that something that comes out of nowhere? Or does it come out of the fact that I've seen someone on the TV that might look a bit like him? I go, oh, I haven't phoned my brother for a while. I'll give him a ring. So when we actually look at our thoughts, it's not that they don't have causes of earlier thoughts. They all have a train that we can tra follow backwards. So I don't think our experience of free will is this a causal event, which is what the philosophers argue about and say, oh, that's really a big problem. I don't think anyone thinks like that. I don't think we ever make the, make choices in our life that we don't think are caused by other stuff that went on in our life. So I think the philosophers have just got us in a muddle with this. But what we do recognize is that there are difference between the things that we do, like me waving my hands around, that we're not aware of, and the things that we do that we are aware of, that we, our conscious mind, seems to play a role in causing it to happen that's what we feel as our free will our conscious mind is actually playing an active role and this is so i i've argued this is how we experience our conscious mind pushing and pulling on the levers of neurons so when our consciousness takes over our actions and instead of, of them being automatic like we might do when we um are driving a car and then we see there's a tree in the middle of the road oh we turn it because our conscious mind has taken control of our actions because it can see the tree and it non-conscious beings don't really see trees very well they just see shades and and uh, different uh, um, uh, objects but they don't see that there's a danger in a tree being in the road but we do and our conscious mind says hey there's a tree there so our conscious mind takes over at that point and starts driving our actions. So that's the electromagnetic field in our brain now push, pulling and pushing on our neurons. And that then feels very different from the stuff that goes on automatically. And that's what we call free will. It's nothing to do with being non-deterministic because there's always a cause, like that tree out there. It's not deterministic, but it is different from the automatic stuff that we so I think our brain works in two modes, the automatic stuff, and then, there's the, and then there's the stuff we call our free will, and our free will that when 
our actions are driven by our conscious mind. We call that free will, but really all we're talking about is our conscious mind taking control. Nothing to do with determinism. I don't think anyone thinks of those actions being non-deterministic. They've always had some cause in the past, but um, they feel different. And that's really our conscious mind. We are aware of those actions as being something that we've thought about, had ideas in our head, and then implemented them. So that's just different two ways of operating in yeah, our brain. I like that. I like that a lot. We, we are part, part of the causal net of the universe, helping to change the causes as they go forward. But the way I think about it is that then, mm. then the universe cannot be predetermined. You know, we can't, you can't say that it was determined at the Big Bang that you and I were going to have this conversation and use these exact words. Um, uh, or, or could you? How, do you? how do you think about the... Why not? The, the, if, if I'm reading why you... Not? Right. Why not? Really? Why not? Yeah. Predetermined? Yeah, because... Well, then, yeah, well, what else is there? If, the, if it's not predetermined, there's only magic. What yes, else it feels can there like be? that. Right. So just, right. There's no ghost in the machine. Yeah, there's no magic. Right. There's, there's no, no magic. ghost in the machine. If there's no magic, then everything is, is determined by the laws of physics, and the laws of physics are deterministic, apart from quantum mechanics and all that gives you a bit of randomness um, at uh, the molecular level, particle level, but usually it doesn't make a difference at the big in the terms of the big decisions that we do. So everything is deterministic. And our thoughts, again, uh, if, you, um, if you think about what you're thinking about now, was it caused by your thoughts a moment ago? Or did some magic come into your head and you complete, think a completely different thought? No, you didn't. Everything no, we no think magic. of is determined by our thoughts a moment before. And if you follow those backwards, then you're going to follow a physical causal chain that will ultimately lead back into the Big Bang. I don't really find a problem with well, that. At so least then the question for is, some of our done... actions, our conscious mind is taking control. Could you have done differently? You, you, you... Yes, yeah, could you know. have done differently? Right, so I'm, I'm driving along the mountain road, and I remember the last time I did this, when I went over 70, I almost got in a bad accident. So now I'm aware of those causal vectors, so I'm going to go under 60 to make sure that if the tree falls, all of a sudden I can do something about it because I'm going slow enough to react. So to me, that feels like I'm doing something different now based on the past history that I know about. But you're saying that's... Even that's what you, what determined. You were, it's, of course it is. It's determined by the fact that when you went over 70, uh, it, could, it nearly caused an accident. So then, who? that's a cause of you saying, right, okay, I've got to take seriously this. There's a good reason for these speed limits. And now your conscious mind is making an impact. It's now your conscious mind is taking control of your actions. You're not just doing things automatically. Your conscious mind is saying, no, look, I'm going over 70. I have to slow down. What you're experiencing is the taking control of your conscious mind. This is what makes us human, that we can take control. Our conscious mind can take control. We can make high-level kind of thinking, which I don't think robots can do, because we, the ideas in our head are already extraordinarily complex objects that we call ideas. And that's what an idea is, an electro... Um, electromagnetic field perturbation that's really complex and got lots of stuff in it, like the fact you nearly had an accident, like the speed limit, like the thought of people who are dying in accidents, all of those are wrapped up in there. And then that thought, which is this complex electromagnetic object in your brain, is influencing how your brain derives, delivers actions to your motor system, your, your uh, hand and your feet, and all of those stuff. Whereas if you're a robot, that wouldn't happen at all. You just do it without any, any involvement of your conscious mind. So that's to me, is what consciousness is about. I think we've just been confused by the philosophers who've given us this determinism problem. But I don't think anyone experiences a thought that doesn't come from anywhere. I've never had. Ooh, I mean, you sometimes say, "Hey, oh, that's a good idea," but it's normally a problem you've been thinking upon, cogitating upon. And there's some non-conscious calculations going on that you don't know about. Like those that I was talking about earlier that are driving the movement of my lips. There are all those kind of non-conscious stuff. And then something kind of rides above the waves and becomes a perturbation big enough that you become aware of it because it's now in your electromagnetic field and then it bangs down on the neurons again. 
says, okay, do this. Mm. That's what we call God's so, will. So back to the medievals and their construction of heaven and hell as a form of behavior control. In a way, I guess you'd, you'd probably argue the modern criminal justice system set up with punishments and rewards and society as a whole, in which we want to nudge people in certain directions by uh, tax systems or choice architecture, punishments, police, and so forth. These are all just doing what the medievals were doing, but more fine-tuned or more, uh, you know, more testable to see what actually works. Um, but you but, but, but so the, we, we, we want the criminal to do something different the next time so that the recidivism rates go down. So we tweak the variables and teach them to learn self-control or, or whatever before we let them out. Um, that would still be along the lines of your deterministic model in which you're aware of the vectors influencing you and you choose to do, choose <laughs> something chooses or whatever to, to act differently the next time. Yeah, it may be that, you know, making people realize the consequences of their actions. They didn't realize so much before when we uh, give um, um, the victims of crime the opportunity to explain to the perpetrators what a disaster it made to their lives. And now we're trying to influence the conscious mind. We're trying to reprogram it. The kind of, say, conscious mind that didn't give a damn about other people suddenly say, okay, they're right. I have to think about that as well. But it's not a causal. It's been caused by the criminal justice system that put these people together who wouldn't normally be together, the perpetrator and the victim. And suddenly they have a communication, but it's all through language. It's all, all, all uh, being delivered to the conscious mind of the perpetrator, who's hopefully being influenced. That now in the electromagnetic field of his or her brain, there is now this empathy that he or she didn't have before. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to control. And like you say, it's instead of doing it with invisible objects like angels and gods and demons and a, a life, an eternity of, in heaven or hell, we're saying, look, this is, this is what we call empathy, and this is why you need to care for other people. You could be that other person. Your children could be that other person. And we try to build in empathy as a way of, um, of uh, uh, persuading people to act uh, um, in, a, in a more reasonable way for the rest of us. Interesting. Oh, we can just John Joe, that's a great place to end the conversation. I think prison. we've covered almost all the great topics there are. Okay. <laughs> this turned out to be a way more interesting conversation <laughs> yeah, than, I, yes. than I thought it would be, and I thought it would be an interesting conversation. So thank you for your book. Thank you for your work, and uh, thank you for coming on the